Thank you for coming and thank you to the folks who are online. I just want to say welcome. My name is Holly Francis. I'm the sustainability coordinator here on campus. I helped plan this event along with the, so the School of Social Innovation and the Campus Green Revolving Fund and the Mad River Climate Action Group founded by adjunct Professor Sal Spinoza. So thank you again for being here. Here to introduce Bill himself is one of our eco reps and our seniors in the environmental studies and policy major, JC Schumacher. Hi y'all, <laughs> my name is JC. I'm the environmental club leader. Um, and I would love to introduce Mr. Bill McKibben to you. Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to The New Yorker, the founder of the first global grassroots climate campaign, 350.org, and recently has helped found the third act a progressive organization movement for people over the age of 60. In 2014, he was awarded the Right Livelihood Prize, which is often referred to as the Alternative Nobel. He has won the Gandhi Peace Award and holds honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities. He is currently the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. He played a leading role in launching the opposition of big oil pipeline projects, such as the Keystone Access Pipeline and the Fossil Fuel Divestment Campaign, which has become the largest anti-corporate campaign in history, with endowments worth more than $40 trillion stepping back from oil, gas, and coal. He has written over a dozen books about the environment, including his first, The End of Nature, which was published in 1989, and his latest book, The Flag, the Cross, and the Station Wagon, a graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened, which was published in 2022. Please join me in welcoming Mr. McKibben to Champlain College and the stage. JC, thank you very much. And Holly, too. Oh, man, I cannot see a thing. Um, um, it is a pleasure to get to be here with you. And truthfully, you're somewhat lucky um, that normally a day like today would knock all the pep out of me entirely. I like winter, and when we have these rainy 40 degree grim days it just sucks the life out of me i hate slush more than just about anything in the world and um so and i'm not that you know dynamic to begin with i'm an old guy who lives at the end of a dirt road up in the mountains and you know mostly i talk to my wife and my dog and things so this could have been a pretty depressing uh evening that we had together but something good enough happened yesterday into today that i'm actually got um, um some life in me uh, about three o'clock yesterday afternoon the new york times moved a story across the wires that the biden administration had decided to accede to this five or six month long campaign that we've been running to get them to stop granting new permits for giant export terminals for liquefied natural gas in the Gulf of Mexico. Now this sounds like something somewhat esoteric and far away, but in fact, this was the biggest fossil fuel expansion plan on earth. If the industry had got everything they wanted, uh, in the next five or six years, U.S. liquefied natural gas exported to other countries would have been producing more greenhouse gases than everything that happens on the continent of Europe, every car and factory and home between Athens and Helsinki. And instead, President Biden became well, he took a stronger step against the oil industry than any of his predecessors have ever taken before. That's not an exceptionally high bar, but it is a great, great thing to have happened. So I've been on the phone all day with my friends down in Louisiana and Texas who've been fighting these monstrosities for years. And you have to live next to these things and understand the environmental justice implications and things and they have just been weeping with joy so i have been happy too and um i'll i say all that at the beginning to you because 
it allows me to go do what I'm going to do, which is tell you the truth about where we stand right now on this planet, without it being quite as grim and despairing as it might otherwise be. We're going to get through the hard stuff in a relatively short order and then start talking more about what we need to do. But it is a great pleasure to be able to do it in that context with a wind fresh in our um, fresh in our hands. So I did as JC said, write the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect back in 1989, which I'm well aware was long before you were born. Um, 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 it may have been before your parents were born, I don't know. Um, 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 long ago. And the tragedy of this story is that we actually knew then what we know now about climate change. We've known all along pretty much what's going on and we haven't done much about it. In fact, human beings have produced more carbon dioxide, burned more coal and gas and oil since 1989 than in all of human history before that time. And as a result, just what the scientists told us was going to happen has now happened. Um, 2023, 2023, that we all lived through, was an extraordinary year. 2023 was really, I think, the year that I was writing about when I wrote that first book, which had the cheerful title, The End of Nature. Um, 2023 was the year that the planet's temperature and the planet's climate system really began to unravel in the most dramatic way yet. This time last year, I started getting calls from oceanographer friends who were telling me that the um, temperature of the ocean measured in buoys around the planet was suddenly spiking higher than it had ever before. And they didn't quite understand what was going on, but they knew that it was bad by late spring. One of those buoys off the Florida Keys uh, registered the highest temperature we'd ever seen in the oceans anywhere. It was uh, for several weeks, these buoys were reporting temperatures of 101 degrees, which is where you set a hot tub if you want to have a hot soak. That's what the ocean was. Okay? And as the summer wore on, those temperatures came on the land with the vengeance. We're able to measure the global average temperature for the Earth um, um, because we have now so many thermometers and satellites and buoys out around the planet that every day we can take their average and give a kind of temperature for the Earth. And the temperature for the planet is always at its maximum during and around the weeks around the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, because the biggest land mass on our Earth is in the northern hemisphere, so it holds the heat sort of more that way. So late June, um, those numbers were extraordinary. Um, the scientists quickly said, we're now seeing days that are hotter than we've ever recorded. Our records with thermometers only go back a couple of hundred years, but scientists are good at using proxy records, um, glacial cores, lake sediments, things like that, to extend the temperature record way back. And so by the solstice, I was, talking to a climatologist who I've known for years who were saying, there is no doubt that these are the hottest days on planet Earth in at least the last 125,000 years, which is really 
saying something. It means no human society that we'd understand as a society has ever lived with a climate like the one we're now experiencing. 125,000 years ago was the first time that, uh, you know, archaeologists sort of record people perhaps beginning to etch symbols onto bones, you know. It's just back at the absolute dawn of, of you know, our species. And, and so we are in extraordinary, extraordinary times. Some of that heat's just deadly by itself, you know, extraordinary heat waves across China and India and Europe killed all sorts of people last year. But of course, it also causes all kinds of other things to happen. You will recall in June last year that because the Arctic is, ocean is now so melted, um, that uh, uh, the northern reaches of Canada lose their snow cover very early. And when it gets hot and dries out like that, things start catching on fire. Things caught on fire with a vengeance last year. Canada had wildfires three times larger than they've ever had before, before the year was out. Those wildfires had produced more carbon than twice as much carbon as all the heating and cooking and flying and cooling and driving that Canadians do in a year, okay? That's a massive feedback loop. But for us down here, what we really noticed was those extraordinary plumes of smoke uh, 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 pouring down uh, uh, out of Canada. I was in Washington, D.C., um, ironically enough, uh, sitting in outside the White House waiting to get arrested on the day in June when they had the worst air quality they'd ever recorded in Washington, D.C. We turned around to look at the White House and the Oval Office was, I don't know, 75 yards away, but you could barely make out the White House. The smoke was so thick. I was almost glad to tell you the truth that for a few days, the kind of power corridor from New York to Washington got to experience a little bit what people around the world get to live with all the time, because those are where the decisions are made in Washington and on Wall Street that so far have guaranteed our inaction. And now perhaps we can begin to get moving. Um, Fire is not the only thing that happens when you raise the temperature like that. If you wanted one physical fact to kind of understand our century, you could do worse than warm air holds more water vapor than cold. As that stuff evaporates and you get drought, eventually you also get deluge when that water comes pouring back down out of the sky. And of course, that's what Vermont got last summer. Vermont had the rainiest summer ever and you know what the results were I, you know it was pretty shocking to be wandering around our state capital this fall and see that it was still basically shut down uh, a ghost town every business and restaurant and things just kind of washed away i live up in ripton which is a little tiny town uh, up on the spine of the Green Mountains in Addison County. And we got more rain, I think, than any town in the state, about 35 inches. Uh, uh, we could not get out of town to the east or the west for weeks because 125 was cut on both sides. Uh, we lost a house about a mile from ours in a landslide. Um, but of course, Vermont, remains at least for the moment prosperous enough that we were you know we're, we will be able to rebuild one way or another and so on and so forth not so much in other places um about a month after the rain worst of the rains finally ended here libya had the worst rainstorm they've ever had in their history and so much rain came down in so short a period that it washed out a pair of big dams, one after another, and then that cascading water smashed into a city and it carried 10,000 people out to the sea where they drowned in an hour. Um, and of course, you know, places like that, people have done almost nothing to cause the problem from which they're now suffering so grievously. 
The entire continent of Africa has put about 4% of all the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, that's it. But they're getting hit harder than any place else. Our country alone has put 25% of all those greenhouse gases in the air. Um, um, no country, not China, not anyone, will ever catch up with us as a supplier of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And it's all still up there. I mean, the stuff that poured out of the tailpipe of my family's maroon Plymouth Fury in 1974 when I was getting my learner's permit, that's all still up there in the sky, uh, 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 trapping heat and raising the temperature of the Earth. Um, 2024 is likely to be even hotter than 2023. But we've entered into a new phase, a new step in this uh, escalation of temperature on the Earth. The planet's clearly resetting itself again at this higher place, and it is not good. We passed pretty much um, that 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature line that we'd pledged in Paris we wouldn't go past. In fact, there were a few days in the autumn when the planet was two degrees Celsius warmer than it had been before the Industrial Revolution on that, against that baseline. Um, and so we are in a tough spot. We burned more fossil fuel last year as a world than we ever had before. So far, we have not managed to get a hold of this crisis. And yet, and yet, there were also things last year that should give us a certain kind of hope. In an almost, um, in a way that's almost sort of too dramatically pat to be quite believable, it was in those same weeks when the temperature was setting new all-time records, higher than it had been in 125,000 years, those same weeks in June, that the planet for the first time passed another mark. Um, we were, by then, reaching the point where we were putting up about a gigawatt's worth of solar panels around the planet every day. That's the rough equivalent of a nuclear power plant's worth of solar panels every day. That's pretty impressive. Now, half of that was in China, but that still leaves a fair amount in the rest of the planet. It's not as much as we need. It's not the pace that we need to be at to begin to curb the heating of the planet, but it's an indication of just what is possible now. And it's possible because the scientists and the engineers have done such a remarkable job. Um, in the last decade, they have lowered the price of renewable energy to the point where it is cheaper than coal and gas and oil. We live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. That is a remarkable moment in human history. It means that if we wanted to really get after this problem, we could. If we really wanted to bend this existential curve, we could. <clears throat> it doesn't come, though it's cheap, it doesn't come for free in other ways. We have to go mine stuff to make this happen, some cobalt and some lithium and things like that. And that comes at environmental cost, and sometimes it comes at human cost. And we need to be working hard to lower that cost, but we're never going to make it go to zero. But that cost is much smaller than the cost of continuing to burn fossil fuel. Ah, not, not just, just the existential, existential crisis that comes with climate change, the single greatest threat by far that humans have ever faced, but also the threat that just comes daily from people having to breathe what happens when you burn coal and gas and oil. Nine million people a year now, we know, and there was a series of good big meta studies that have come out in the last couple of years that finally put a firm number on it. Nine million people a year die 
from breathing the, com by, the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. How many is nine million? It's one death in five on this planet. Now, if you've been to Shanghai or, or Delhi in recent years, that won't come as an extraordinary surprise because the air you know is filthy. There's five million children in New Delhi. We think two and a half million have irreversible lung damage just from breathing the air, okay? Um, um, and it happens here too, hundreds of thousands of cases of childhood asthma um, um, because of fossil fuel combustion. And you know very well who gets to live next to the highway and next to the refinery and breathe that air. Um, and we also know more than we did even a few years ago, the other cost of depending on fossil fuel. Um, if you depend on something that only exists in a few deposits around the world, the people who control those deposits end up with way too much power, which they then abuse, whether it's the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons who used their winnings to degrade and deform our democracy, or whether it's the king of Saudi Arabia, or whether it's Vladimir Putin who took his, uh, 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 cashed in his oil and gas chips and used it to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century. Um, those are the costs that go with fossil fuel. Ah, and they're no longer necessary. We do not need to burn that stuff. We don't need to burn anything, really, including wood in our giant wood stove over at McNeil. Um, we don't need to burn it because we now know how to make full use of the fact that the good Lord was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles up in the sky. We could end combustion on the surface of the planet and just rely on the combustion that's happening up there. We can catch the rays of that sun directly on photovoltaic panels, and we can take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, creating the wind that turns those turbines. And now we have ever cheaper batteries to store that stuff when the sun goes down or the wind drops. We could do it, we just have to do it at a scale that really matters. And so far, we're not at a scale large enough. There's a few reasons for that. And one of them is inertia. And one of them is that, you know, humans are not always great at, you know, doing the things that we really need to do. We kind of get stuck in our own ways. Think about here in Vermont. Um, We've turned down, our state government has turned down solar farms in the state of Vermont solely on aesthetic grounds, on the grounds that we don't want to look at. That's, I think, not okay at this point in human history. An emergency means that you behave differently than you otherwise would. And one of the things you do is start developing a slightly different aesthetic so that if you look out at some solar panels in a field someplace, you think, well, that looks okay because it's the sign of people beginning to take responsibility to grow a crop that they need. We actually don't need as much corn as we have. Um, um, you know, we wash in milk, uh, which is what that corn turns into. Corn is just, well, if you think about it, corn is an inefficient solar collector that requires that you pour a lot of nitrogen on it in order to make it grow, nitrogen that then washes into Lake Champlain. Um, and farmers who grow that corn have been going broke for decades. Uh, electrons are a crop that we actually need and use lots of. And if you put some solar panels up, well, then you take some stress off those fields and give them a vacation for a while so that the soil, and now we know how to grow row crops in between them, increasingly how to graze animals in between them and on and on and on. So it's time to put human ingenuity to use. But the real reason that we're not making the shift in the time that we have is because, I mean, this would be a hard 
job, even if everybody was working in good faith, but everybody is not working in good faith. We have a giant industry, the fossil fuel industry, that is determined to keep on doing their thing. They're determined to keep burning stuff. And if you think about that industry, you begin to understand why they're working so hard to make sure that we don't build solar panels and wind turbines and things. Um, here's a way to picture it in your mind. 40% of all the ship traffic on planet Earth, all the ships that ply the high seas, 40% of them are just carrying coal and oil and gas back and forth places to get burned. That gives you, first of all, some idea of how much we could begin to dematerialize the, uh, 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 the economy of the world if we went to renewable energy. Um, and we could because, you know what? The sun delivers that energy for free every day when it rises above the horizon, um, which is great, except if you're an oil company and you've gotten rich for a hundred years by making people write you a check every month forever to bring you some more of it. In that case, the idea that the sun just delivers it for free is the stupidest business plan you've ever heard of. And you will do what you can to keep, and they can do a lot to keep it from happening. They have done everything they can to wreck our politics and the politics of countries around the world. You'll perhaps recall that the World Climate Conference this year was in Dubai, and it was chaired by the head of the Dubai Oil Company, which has announced plans to increase its production 30% in the years ahead, just what scientists have said we can't do. And so it was an extraordinary tussle to even get in the final document from that conference one sentence that used the word fossil fuel. It's a document this thick. There's one, I mean, it's as if you had, if you had a, like a huge lung cancer conference and there was one mention of the possibility that cigarettes might have something to do with this trouble, okay? But it was a good sentence. Activists worked incredibly hard, and really, uh, our diplomats, John Kerry in particular, worked hard too to make sure that there was one sentence in there that said, we pledge to start transitioning away from fossil fuel. They fought like heck to keep it out, but it's in. And the fact that it's in is one of the reasons that we won this fight yesterday on LNG in the Gulf. Because as we said to President Biden and his team, there is no way that you can sign a piece of paper saying we are transitioning off fossil fuel and then build 20 huge export terminals designed to last for 40 years to keep pumping this stuff. What I'm trying to tell you is the fight is now fully engaged. The planet is warming, yes, and disastrously, but we are beginning to fight back in all the ways that we can. And all of us need to be in that fight. Perhaps some of you here are terrific solar engineers who know how to take the solar panel and make it three or four or 5% more efficient over the next decade. And if you are one of those people, then you should get up right now and return to the lab where you work and get back to it because that's really important, okay? But if you're not one of those people, then you need to join the rest of us in building the kind of movements that can stand up to and break the political power of the fossil fuel industry so we can get this job done. And that's what I'm mostly going to talk to you now about as I ramble on here. I'm going to talk about that movement building um, because that's what I've spent much of the last 20 years doing. Not as, you know, a job. It's all volunteer work for me and it's not what I really know how to do. I'm a writer by trade. I'm not much of a, you can tell I'm not a great public speaker and I'm not whatever, but I've learned 
to do what I can because at a certain point I began to understand that writing another book was not going to move the needle sufficiently. That we also needed, we were, we were winning the argument, we were just losing the fight because the fight was about money and power and Exxon had so much that it didn't matter what the data and the evidence and things said, they were just kept on doing what they were doing, so we had to build power. And the only way to do that, if you don't have a lot of money, is to build movements. In certain ways, this movement, global movement, had deep roots here in the western side of Vermont. There were people in this room who walked with us in 2006 when we had uh, this climate march up the west side of Vermont. We began at Robert Frost's old summer riding cabin up in the Green Mountains because he's as close to a patron saint as we have, somewhat grumpy patron saint, but you know, whatever. Um, and we walked for five days up, well, some of the time on Route 7 uh, and, you know, so on. And uh, 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 up here, we slept in farm fields at night. I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so I had called the Methodist churches en route to make sure that there would be potluck suppers, the Methodist sacrament would be available along the way as we marched and things. And by the time we got to Burlington, there were, uh, you know, a thousand people marching, which you guys, you know, for Burlington, for Vermont, thousand people is actually quite a lot of people. I remember Bernie Sanders, my dear friend who was running at that point for his Senate seat. He wasn't yet a senator in 2006. That was the first election he was running for it. And he greeted us on the edge of town as we came in and he came running up to me and he said, this is great, this is great. I haven't seen anything like this since Vietnam. This is fantastic. This is so great. What is this about again? Um, 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 and he's, he's gone on to be the great champion of all of this work in the Congress, and we cannot thank him enough. Um, it was pretty great to see all those people there. What was not great was to read a story in the free press the next day. This was back in the days when the free press still had stories in it. And, um, 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 and it said, that thousand people that assembled in Burlington was probably the biggest demonstration that had yet taken place in the United States about climate change. We read that, we were like, well, you know, no wonder we're not doing so good. We've got all the things you need for a movement. We've got the scientists and the policy people and Al Gore and whatever. The only part of the movement we forgot was the movement part. There's nobody there to make it work. And so, um, we set to work, and when I, in this case, when I say we, I mean me and seven undergraduates at Middlebury up the road here, uh, where I hang out some of the time. And we set to work. We had no idea what we were doing, but we formed this thing called 350.org, which took its name from what the scientists told us was the most carbon we could safely have in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million a number we're already way north of. We're about 420 parts per million now, which is why, you know, Vermont floods and California burns. Um, at any rate, we wanted that name because it made sense, but also because we wanted to organize globally. And we figured Arabic numerals are easier than English words to, you know, sort of cross linguistic boundaries. And so we set out somewhat ludicrously to you know, there were seven students, there are seven continents, each one took one. The guy who took the Antarctic also had to take the internet, you know, and, and we set to work and our job was just to find other people like ourselves. And, uh, 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 and, and so we did. Um, we first big goal was to have this day of action in the, I think it's the autumn of 2009. And um, we just started reaching out to people around the world and said, let's do this. Uh, 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 and I think because sort of beginner's luck and unfilled ecological niche and things, people started responding. Um, we told everybody to gather on a 
uh, on a Saturday, wherever they were, that same Saturday. But the couple of days before, we had a little office up on Pine Street, one room, and we were sitting around our table, and the satellite phone rang, and it was our leader in Ethiopia, and she was, you know, like most of us, uh, she, and like a surprising number of us, 17 years old, and she said, the government's taken away our permit for Saturday, so we're doing things today before they can stop us, which was brave, but she was crying. That's not why she was crying. She was crying because she said, we wanted to do this the same day as everybody else. We wanted to be part of the whole thing. We're sorry. We hope we're not spoiling it for everybody. Um, and we have 10,000 young people out in the street right now in Addis Ababa chanting 350. And we were like, well, do not worry about the date. You've done good. And she had done good. And it was a sort of harbinger. Over that weekend, there were um, 5,100 demonstrations in 181 countries around the globe. Uh, CNN called it the most widespread day of political activity on the planet's history. There were 200 demonstrations in China. China hadn't yet become as authoritarian as it is now. We could not do this today in China or in Russia or in a number of other countries that have gone in a bad direction. Um, um, that's the Student Government Association in the Maldives illustrating the problem that comes from being living on an archipelago uh, where the highest point above the sea is about two meters. People have lived in the Maldives for 5,000 years, but the chances that they get through this century seem somewhat low at this point, but they're fighting. Um, there were, there were uh, a bunch of pictures that ended up in a file marked 350 adorable and they were adorable but they were also hard to look at those girls are in the maldives they're likely to be refugees before their lives are out and obviously not because of anything they did you know so you know we kept organ we've organized we think about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except north korea and some of them very beautiful we had to borrow satellites once for this thing we did that was like the largest art project in history we had all these huge installations all around the world that used thousands and thousands of bodies to make various images i think that might have been my favorite in santa fe where when the satellite came over a couple of thousand people just held blue blankets up overhead to bring that dry riverbed back to life for a minute you know um, and truthfully, we would have gone on doing this kind of basically educational work for a while, except that we didn't have a while. Things were too pressing. So we moved from education to confrontation, too. And these are pictures from the beginning of the fight against the Keystone Pipeline, which turned into one of the probably the biggest single environmental battle of the last decade. Um, and, you know, this 1,254 people went to jail um, and eventually, uh, uh, and some of them in this room again, eventually we ended up winning. Um, um, and organizing just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's a march in 2014 in New York City that had 400,000 people at it that we organized. And, and it was stuff like this that allowed us to get those agreements in Paris that at least got us headed finally in the right direction. But it took people all over the world while we were marching in, uh, in New York our friends at 350 in the South Pacific were um, doing their own action, which was even more beautiful. Uh, each of these islands, the Marshall Islands, the Solomons, uh, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, places that may not exist much longer, but their slogan is, we're not drowning, we're fighting. Each one of them had made a uh, carved uh, war canoe, each of these countries out of a tree on the island, and they brought them to Newcastle in Australia, which is the biggest coal port in the world. And for a day, they used them to blockade the largest ore ships in the world, to keep these coal carriers uh, in port. And it was a powerful, powerful symbolic action um, that really began to wake up Australia to what they were doing. Um, 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 but for me, more than anything else, 
those images became a kind of mark of what was happening. Um, there are a few tropes that kind of run through our literature, our thought. One of them is the fight of the small and the many against the mighty and the few. And that's what we're engaged in, and that's what movement building is about. Now, I'm going to finish by saying that there is a strong generational component to this fight. One of the things that's most striking about climate change is that it impacts young people far more than it impacts older people in the sense that I'm going to be dead before the very worst of this kicks in. But if you're, oh, I don't know, 21 right now, um, doesn't matter what great career you're preparing for here at Champlain, by the time you're my age or any place close to it, if we do not get this thing under control, then your job's going to be emergency response because that's what everybody's job is going to be. So it is no wonder that young people have risen to the occasion, come to the fore. That's who started 350.org. We ran this huge divestment campaign that was mostly, a lot of it was on college campuses. And we've got, you know, at this point, Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge and Princeton and the University of California and University of Michigan and pretty much all the colleges in Vermont and everybody else to divest from fossil fuel. And it's been great, very helpful. Uh, as JC said, $40 trillion in endowments that have divested. But the biggest harvest from that work were the young people on all those college campuses who learned what they were doing. When they got out of college, they formed the Sunrise Movement. Um, and that's what brought us the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal, once it had been run through the congressional sausage making machinery and survived its encounter with Joe Manchin and things, emerged as the Inflation Reduction Act, which is by no means a perfect bill, but it's the first thing, the first thing literally that our Congress ever really did to respond to climate change 35 years after they were warned about it by Jim Hansen in his testimony in 1988 and the hundreds of billions of dollars in that inflation reduction act are now at work starting to do remarkable things we have young people to thank for that and of course we have even younger people to thank for really the the biggest spike in this movement um Greta Thunberg is one of the most remarkable human beings of our time I really adore her she's one of my favorite people I it was a great pleasure in June to get to write her a, a letter on the occasion of her graduation from high school. Think about that for a moment. Um, um, she'd be the first to say that there are 10,000 Gretas around the world. There really are great youth organizers, and they have 10 million followers. That's how many kids were out on school strike in September of 2019. Um, before the pandemic hit, protesting climate. So young people have done their part in lots and lots of ways. Um, but I heard one too many people my age say, oh, it's up to the next generation to solve this problem, which seemed A, to be ignoble, um, and B, to be impractical, because for all their earnestness and intelligence and idealism and energy, young people lack the structural power to make the change that we need in the time that we have. Scientists have told us we have to cut emissions in half by 2030 to stay on path to meet anything like those Paris climate targets. 2030 is five years and 11 months away. We do not actually have time for, you know, the class of 2024 at Champlain to, you know, become senators and CEOs and so on and so forth and make change. We're going to have to do it together. So I started looking around for who did have structural power. You know? And at least one of the answers, a compelling answer, is 
old people like me. Um, I have said on occasion that if you have reached the age where you have hair coming out of your ears, you probably have structural power coming out of your ears too. There are 70 million of us over the age of 60 in this country, okay? And we punch way above our weight politically because we all vote. There is no known way to stop old people from voting, okay? Um, um, and we ended up with most of the money, fair or not. Uh, the boomers and the silent generation have about 70% of the country's financial assets at this point. So if you want to push around Washington or Montpelier or Wall Street, it probably helps to have some people with hairlines like mine, okay? Um, so that's why we started this group, Third Act, that I want you to tell your grandparents about so they can join up, because it has grown like Topsy in the last two years since we started. We're now at about 75,000 people across the country, including a Cracker Jack chapter here in Vermont um, that are doing amazing, amazing things. People had not tried organizing older people for quite a while because the theory was that older people, people become more conservative as they age. I don't know if that was true in the past, but I do not think it's true at the moment because if you're 60 or 70 or 80 now, it means your first act was back in that period of really remarkable social, cultural, political transformation of the 1960s and the 1970s, the period when we started taking women seriously in public life, the apex of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the first Earth Day in 1970, when 20 million Americans, 10% of the then population of this country, went into the streets and within a year had secured the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and the EPA and on and on and on. Um, if you have any doubts about how powerful that period was, just look at what the retrograde Supreme Court has tackled in their uh, uh, last two years. They've gone after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Gun Control Act of 1968, the Clean Air Act of 1971, and Roe v. Wade 1973. They are dismantling the things that we won in our youth, and it's time for us to fight back, and so that's what we're doing. Um, and I show this for the young people in the room, partly to recruit your grandparents, but partly just to give you a sense that there are people who are trying to have your back and help as best we can. Because I think that there is sometimes a sense among young people that they have been a little bit abandoned by those who came before them, that people got the best stuff out of this world and then kind of left them in their own devices. At any rate, uh, third act has been great. We know how to do lots of things, like make quilts and stuff. Um, um, and, and we know how to laugh at ourselves on occasion, too. Here's, here's people showing up in Nevada uh, at the midterm elections. Um, we picked Nevada for third actors from across the West Coast to gather because we thought it would be the decisive Senate seat. And it turned out to be that, and we won that Senate seat by a couple of thousand votes in Nevada. And it was very good to see that we were able to do that. Um, and one of the things we learned was that older people are actually quite good at this. Knocking on doors to get people to, has become a problem because people don't want to answer the door so much anymore. We're kind of isolated in, but it turns out that if, you know, someone, uh, 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 well, if, you know, if an old person knocks, you're not really that scared, you know, um, what are they going to do to you? So people, you know, pay some attention. And, and we also just were, um, you know, our, our big banner when we assembled in, uh, in Nevada to talk about climate change in the election, we had a big banner that just said fossils against fossil fuels, you know. Um, um, so we're good at figuring out how to not take ourselves more seriously than we should. There I am knocking on a door someplace. Um, this year, last year, 2023, our big campaign was against the huge banks, City Chase, 
Wells Fargo, Bank of America, that are the four biggest funders in the world of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, if you have a, if you had money sitting in one of those banks, say you had, uh, you'd worked all your life and you had $100,000 in an account, retirement account, and it was sitting in one of those banks, it's getting lent out to build pipelines and things. It's producing more carbon on average than everything combined that the average person does in a year. All the cars they drive, the flights they take, the heat, whatever, is less than the amount of carbon produced by what their money is doing. So we want these guys to change. So we did a big day of action. And we had 100 demonstrations in 100 cities, a lot of them doing civil disobedience and things, um, um, including wonderful work here in Vermont. Uh, I got to say, people were just doing fantastic stuff uh, up on Church Street at the Chase Bank. I was in Washington, D.C. that day where we had thousands of people out. And it was great. We were doing sit-ins. Um, against these banks but you know what we have become too old to sprawl on the sidewalk for four or five hours at a time so we went to the goodwill every goodwill store in the greater washington area and got every rocking chair they had you know and it was the most comfortable sit-in i've ever done by far um and Next day, the New York Times was calling it the rocking chair rebellion, you know, uh, uh, and, and it was great. And that's what we were getting ready to do um, in two weeks time in Washington outside the Department of Energy about this LNG thing. And that's what we managed to call off a few hours ago because well, because you know what? Part of the Biden administration wanted to do the right thing. And part of the Biden administration did not want just pictures of hundreds and thousands of people sitting in in rocking chairs outside the Department of Energy. You know, the best actions you do are the ones that you don't have to do because you won before, you know, and we were very, very grateful. So this kind of activism, that's my... That's my mother, uh, 93 years old now, uh, 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 joining in. Um, this kind of stuff we shouldn't have to do. I've been arrested, I think, I don't know, a dozen times or something. And every time I get put in handcuffs, I just feel so foolish. Like. Why on earth do we have to do this in order to get our leaders to pay attention to physics? This is the weirdest, but that's sometimes what it takes. I think the bottom line point that I'd like to make about it is, Americans tend to default towards the individual on everything that we do. Um, so if we think of something like climate change, the very first questions that we start asking ourselves is, what's on my roof, what's in my garage, whatever. Those are useful questions to ask. I'm glad that I have solar panels all over the roof, and I'm glad that they connect to uh, you know, an EV in the garage, and I'm glad there's a couple of uh, uh, car chargers up there in the parking lot, and they both were in use when I got here, so they better build some more. Um, and uh, uh, on and on and on, but we are past the point where we're gonna make the climate math square one Tesla at a time, okay? The most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual and join together with others in order to build movements large enough and strong enough and creative enough and beautiful enough to change the economic and political ground rules a little. And when we do that, we make change. And that's why we've set up things like 350.org and Third Act, and they've built the Sunrise Movement and, you know, all the other things that are out there for people. Um, I'm afraid that that's what we have to do if we're going to make it through this most perilous period that humans have ever faced. 
I said 2023 was a physically extraordinary year, nothing like it in the record of the time that humans have been on this planet. 2024 and 2025 and 2026 better be extraordinary years in political sense. We better fight these fights hard um, and make progress as fast as we possibly can because we are running out of years in which to do them. Uh, Dr. King, my great hero, used to end speeches by quoting from the Massachusetts abolitionist Theodore Parker. And he'd say the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, i.e. this may take a while, but we're going to win, which was a very comforting thought for the very brave people trying to build the civil rights movement. The arc of the physical universe is short and it bends toward heat. If we don't win this soon, then we do not win it. It is a timed test, unlike any we've ever faced before, which explains uh, the urgency with which at least it feels to me. And I cannot tell you what the outcome is going to be. We do not know. Um, I can't guarantee you that even if we do everything right, we're gonna win. All I can guarantee you is that there are you have many millions of brothers and sisters in this fight of all colors and ethnicities and also of all ages all around the planet doing what they can. And we shall see. We shall see if we can work hard enough to take full advantage of the gifts that we've been given, like the power of the sun, in order to make change in the time that we have. We'll find out. Thank you all very much. Now, I, I've rattled on rather a long time, but we still have a little bit of time for questions and things, yes? And so I think we have both questions. In, in the modern world, we have questions both here in the room, perhaps, and also in the great ether appearing through the that someone's gonna read us right from the from the web so let's start with ones that we can sal you get first dibs here uh, oh thank you bill can for we that. maybe turn down the light just a tiny bit so i can see enough to see or turn up the light or set there we go good and this will help you leave too if you want so yes. thank you bill uh I really appreciate your presentation. This is my third one that I've heard from you, and none of them are the same. So I wondered <laughs> if you had a canned presentation. He doesn't. I just talk. This is new stuff. Um, I have three questions, but I'm only going to take one because other people may may want to step in. The um, I really like. <clears throat> your statement that older people have had the benefit of the combustion of fossil mm -hmm. fuels and older people have the political and a lot of the monetary wherewithal to make a difference. Mm. I've been stewing on those two things for a long time. It was gratifying to hear you say that. Um, but whether old or not, sometimes the, the forces that seem to be opposed to what we would like to see happen are so overwhelming that we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to gather ourselves. Sometimes it, we feel alone. Uh, we can yeah. create a little group and try to do something, but it's so overwhelming. I don't know, This is maybe there's a psychological basis for this question, how do we get past that and motivate well, towards some of the goals you've articulated? I mean, that's a very good question, but that's exactly why we form things like Third Act, you know? Like, look, um, you could have been concerned about the fact that we were building giant LNG export terminals in the Gulf, or you might not even have heard of it, um, but you wouldn't have been able to do anything about it on your own, you know? Um, but because we have 
75,000 people who could write letters, we were able to get it on the agenda in a way. And then we were able to say, we're gonna be coming down to do a sit-in and do you want that? And, you know, and suddenly we were getting, you know, co be able to talk with people in the White House and make the point and so on and so on. And we were able to build coalitions with the Sierra Club and the Hip Hop Caucus and people down in the Gulf Coast and on and on and on, all of whom are like, yeah, we're in. Um, let's make this work. And, and so that's how it, that's, I mean, movement, there, there were two great technologies, I think, from the 20th century. One was the solar panel, and the other was the nonviolent social movement, which didn't really exist before the 20th century until people like Gandhi and Dr. King and a million people whose names we don't know figured out how you build these kind of big movements. Before then, if you wanted to change something, you had to figure out how to raise an army and, you know, beat the other guys. But, you know, now we've sort of learned some different techniques. And so that's what we do. And it doesn't always work. But, I, you know, I'm in one of those days when it's like, uh, you know, when we fight, we sometimes win. So we might as well fight. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. How do you convince the older people in your life to listen to you about climate change? A very good question. I mean, some of the time you're not going to win, okay? Um, I tell people in the fall, like, don't wreck Thanksgiving dinner arguing with your crazy uncle about climate change, because if you've spent the last 20 years, you know, marinating in Tucker Carlson or something, the odds that you're going to be able to think clearly about this are somewhat small and whatever, you know. But do at Thanksgiving take aside your sweet aunt, you know, who probably is kind of worried about her grandkids or kids or something. I mean, the polling data shows that 70% of Americans understand pretty well what's going on with climate change. The problem is less convincing that other 30% than it is taking some significant part of that 70% and getting them to actually do something. How do you get them to do something? You got to get them to do something by helping, by giving them some avenues. So introduce them to things like Third Act, you know, where there's lots of other old people where they feel here's a secret for you know, sometimes old people feel a little uncomfortable in things that are all young people because we know that you all are laughing at us all the time you know um we understand that we are figures of fun uh uh to you so it's good sometimes that we have our own a little bit of our own places to go and organized because to you know to us old people just seem fine you know normal um uh, uh you know whatever um and 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 when we get together we we um console each other by reminding ourselves that it was our generation if nothing else that produced the greatest music of all time okay <laughs> and, and, and and so we just you know play each other. I mean, it's been one of the great things about Third Act is we've gotten, you know, Carol King is helping out and Neil Young and, you know, all, all, all these kind of people, Patti Smith, um, 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 all the cool people who are still alive who are joining in. So that makes it easier, you know, we uh, 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 brings back some of some of some I mean, because like our first act was pretty good. Our second act it's possible that as a whole we were somewhat more concerned with consumerism than citizenship you know so it takes a little bit to recapture uh, some of that sometimes so send them in our direction and we'll see what we can do good question uh i have a question from someone online the stakes of getting arrested being penalized at school losing a job etc are incredibly high for so many and sometimes those stakes can pressure us into shaping our collective action efforts to accommodate institutions and the status quo. For young movement builders and organizers, what are your tips for being boldly disruptive with our mobilization efforts, even when it's scary? Well, those are very good questions. Um, and, and actually, it's one of these very good generational questions to get at. Um, so, so 
I, so I wrote the letter that asked people to come to Washington to get arrested at the beginning of this Keystone Pipeline fight, which was turned into the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in a very long time. 1,254 people went to jail, I think. And one of the things I said in that letter was, in this case, I do not think young people should have to be the cannon fodder. Um, because if you're 19, it really is possible that an arrest record may not be the single best thing for your resume. One of the unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they gonna do to you, you know? Um, and so it was with pleasure that I watched people with similar hairlines arriving in DC. Now, when people were getting arrested, we did not say to them, um, how old are you? That would be rude. But we did say, cleverly I think, who was president when you were born? And the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. Uh, the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. He was old enough that he had been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was truthfully long enough ago that I'd forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Um, um, what was good was young people who were there got to see their elders acting in the ways that we actually need elders acting in a working society, not necessarily getting arrested. That, you know, civil disobedience is the smallest part often of these fights, you know, and mostly it's much more mundane stuff, petition writing, lobbying, phone calling, Facebooking, on and on and on. But what was good was seeing people of any age going outside their comfort zone. Because the planet is so far outside its comfort zone now that the rest of us need to be there too, somehow, some way or another. And that means different things for different people. I mean, my mom is not going to jail. I'm not going to let her. I mean, that would not be smart, you know. Um, but she can figure out, and she has, her retirement community is, man, completely wired. At the drop of a hat, there's 200 letters going anywhere we need them, and you know, so on and so forth. So a lot can get done. Yes? So, you know, as a college student, we're often paying where yeah, yeah. meal plan yeah, yeah. and you see stories everywhere like oh they spent this much to do a climate bill they spent this much to uh, donate how are ways to support like this movement how to support the climate when maybe you're not in the best financial position yeah don't worry about it. i mean the money is the least of it um um you know good movement building takes almost you know, very little we did that you know we 350.org when we did that thing i was showing you with 5,100 demonstrations in uh, 181 countries. I think our total budget was $70,000 for that year or something like that. I mean, money is good organizing doesn't require huge amounts of money because you have, you know, you just have to rely on people volunteering and doing things. So don't let that get in your way. Um, um, would be be my advice. Find a group to work with and. They're out there and people are ready to work. So, you know, in Vermont, there's great groups. 350 Vermont is a wonderful operation. The Sunrise Movement has chapters here. People ready to go. You'll find a home to do this kind of stuff. Yes. Yes, there must be one up there somewhere. Okay. Oh, that's loud. Uh, okay. Uh, this is probably a very, very dumb question, but have you ever considered running for public office or something? <laughs> I'm mostly asking because there's like a 70% chance that Bernie Sanders is going to retire. And look, there aren't a lot of famous of, people in Vermont. <laughs> one of my, uh, one of my, one of the great pleasures of living in Vermont is that I don't have to go 
run for office because there's lots of good people here. So if Bernie retires, it's abundantly clear that that Becca Balint is ready to take over, you know, and move right on up and she'll be great and ready to go. And there's people who's ready to move into her seat and so on and so forth. Um, um, I, I'm not, I'm, I would be badly, I would be a very poor, uh, I, I would, it would not work out well with me in Congress. I'm afraid the first time I had to sit in the same room with Marjorie Taylor Greene or something, I just would not be able to do it and successfully. And, you know, um, and I'm glad that the people who, the people who do do that are, are do a, do a remarkable service and it's been really wonderful i mean vermont's had a superb delegation of people and there are so many others one of my great great friends in the world really old and dear friends is jamie raskin um uh the congressman now from maryland who uh, you know has done as much to hold the country together in the last four or five years as anyone i can think of and it's a real calling but for most of us, that's never going to be our calling. We need to be able to organize on the outside in order to help. You know, Bernie can't get anything done unless there are people out there changing the, changing the world to let him do it. The best politicians need us to clear the ground in front of them, to change the zeitgeist so that they can make things happen. And when it works right, that sort of synergy is really something to watch. That's what just happened with this fight over LNG and Joe Biden. Um, he probably sort of wanted to do the right thing, kind of, but he's got a thousand things going on. And so we built a movement to say, this thing is an important thing, and we will provide you with the, uh, we'll make sure that if you do it, there are a lot of people saying it's a good thing and standing up to the oil, because we know the oil industry is going to come after you. Now they already are as of this afternoon, you know, and they'll spend a fortune, but we're going to make sure that that redounds to your advantage so you can do it again and I, you know I, I i don't like everything joe biden's done but i'm going to spend the next year making sure he's reelected because if he isn't we're going to lose everything that we've won uh you know in in 24 hours you know so no no not a, not not at all not at all i'm i'm the other reason i'll just add I'll just add the other reason that I couldn't do this is uh, uh, the other reason I live in Vermont is because I require a daily dose of being out in the woods and just the thought of sitting in Washington. I mean, God bless Pat Leahy. I have no idea how he did it. So, you know, good for him. We have any others here? Yes. Oh, we got one up here. They can go first. Well, he's already gotten one, so you get one. Okay. With fossil fuel lobbyists like the Koch brothers, can we effectively stop the effects of climate change in our current economic structure? Well, I mean, this is sort of a good question. I mean, uh, another way to say it would be, you know, uh, would like another way of saying that be like, do we have to reform capitalism before we can yeah I yeah sort of thought that's what you're getting at and i think it's a good question um truthfully if we've got six years in order to cut emissions in half we're not going to dramatically change our economic system in the next six years at least i don't have a kind of way to do it that i can see so we better figure out how to do it without but and i think this is important um, I think the most subversive thing we could do to our economic system is move quickly towards renewable energy. Energy next to food, those are the two most important commodities in the world. And we can produce both of them, but definitely energy close to home because the sun shines everywhere and the wind blows everywhere. And if we were doing that, then we would start eroding these concentrations of power and wealth that support the Koch brothers, that support all of so many of the oligarchs and things around the world. 
um, um, they're deeply threatened by a world that runs on sun and wind, you know, precisely because it's no longer in their control. So the quickest way I can think of to start knocking the pins out from under the unfair parts of our economic system, I can't think of any way quicker than moving dramatically towards renewable energy. And it's why it annoys me sometimes if you can probably tell, I get annoyed once in a while, like even in a wonderful place like Vermont, the like unwillingness to, you know, we haven't put up a windmill in years now. There's a de facto moratorium on it basically in this state. And that's crazy. I mean, I understand why people don't want to, you know, we're used to looking at things, but there are times when I think our state motto should be do anything you want once I'm dead, you know, um, um, and that's not a very good state motto we should be moving more quickly than we are to to make those kind of changes it's dumb that vermont sends hundreds of millions of billions of dollars a year out of vermont to texas and saudi arabia and wherever else to uh, uh heat our homes power our cars whatever else when we could be doing it here within the borders of this state Hi, um, can you talk more about the human cost of mining cobalt and how we could lessen that because, sure. you know, from a humanitarian perspective, sure. it's quite awful, but also um, sure. decrease our dependence on fossil fuels. Thank sure. You. So uh, cobalt's a you know, good example. Cobalt's mostly at the moment mined in the Congo and under the often dreadful conditions. So a couple of things are going on. One, people are starting to figure out how you build batteries without cobalt and, and things. And that does two things. One, it reduces the amount of mining, but two, it, it gives the companies that are doing that mining in the Congo a strong incentive to start cleaning up their act and make it a much more humane operation. And indeed, that's actually started to happen. There's been some good reporting in the last couple of years about the fact that things are getting somewhat better in those mines, and in those communities. People are doing things like building schools and whatever else. Amnesty International did a big report on this last year and said, enough is going on that we don't we, we 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 don't think the answer is just stop mining cobalt because then this potential source of wealth for these parts of the world will disappear so i hope we can make that happen but it's probably not going to be perfect mining's always pretty much a terrible business i think the way to think about it one way to think about it is I mean, because in coal mining is terrible business too. I mean, there's millions of people around the world with black lung disease from mining coal. Um, the difference between mining lithium or cobalt and mining coal is if you get some lithium or cobalt and you put it in a battery, it lasts 25 years doing its work. When you mine coal, what do you do? You set it on fire and then the next day you have to go mine some more. So the best estimates I've seen are that the total mining burden on the planet would drop about 80% if we move to a renewable energy economy. But we, there's no excuse for doing it badly in any event. So work with groups uh, you know, that are working hard to improve life in those places. Yeah. cars um but what are we supposed to do like with with our cars that we already have that run on petrol like should we just sell them off to the next person that's going to use it yeah no for... I, you know use yeah. it mean probably if you've got a car that's not some giant hulking thing just you know drive it till you till it till it runs out and then get an ev and uh, whatever but truthfully i mean especially in a place like burlington to me the more exciting development i mean evs are great and they have a place and we need them the most interesting thing that's happened in the last five years is the rise of the e-bike and they're we're selling more of them around the world than we are of evs and there's huge parts of asia in particular 
where that's just become because it's it's the sort of magic you know i mean like I, I, if people who've been on one of the e-bikes um i mean like i'm a good puritan you know i like riding uphill and you know hurting myself and stuff but but really the hills like disappear like you know it's it, it's almost magical and it takes essentially no energy in order to make them run so you know in a place like burlington I mean, think how nice burlington would be if it was basically just a, a big bike path you know uh, uh, everywhere um and there's no real reason it shouldn't be you know just you know and every once in a while outsiders like me would arrive and park at the edge of town and then you'd hand us a you know municipal e-bike and we'd get where we need to go so um, um a good thing to work on so yep sure Thank you. So um, I had two questions. I'm going to limit it to one. You've been doing a lot of work here. The, um, the world, if I'm not mistaken, meets every now and then to discuss climate change, mm. absent a, a country or two. Uh, it used to be referred to as the COP, the Conference of Parties. I don't know if it still is. Yes, it is. So my question is really s simple. I'm sure you've studied them you've looked at their their work and you have probably analyzed what they have done or not done do you consider it i don't know how to ask this question has it been a success yeah. or a to, failure yeah and if something needs to be fixed do you have any sense of uh, what that would be so it's you know it's these the global climate negotiations and all our work has been a failure in the sense that the poles are melting and the earth is a lot hotter now than it was when they started um and these global climate talks that happen every november the last one as i said was in dubai are incredibly frustrating i've been to most of them over the years um and you know they get there's 70,000 people at the last one and you know essentially very little happens but when things happen they do matter the one in Paris in 2015 the world committed to trying to hold the temperature increase to less than two degrees as close to 1.5 degrees as possible and that was the work of activists pushing hard to get that number in and once it was in, it rewrote the calculus for how we think about these things. Suddenly, everybody was studying uh, how to get to 1.5 degrees, and companies were having to come up with plans that met a 1.5 degree target. And on it, we haven't met them all, but it did get us moving in the right direction. In this last one in Dubai, we got this sentence that said, we are transitioning away from fossil fuel. And yesterday, that sentence got us uh, a halt to the permitting of huge LNG terminal. You, it's, they don't happen on their own, but these are things that activists can then take and use. All right. So if you're waiting for like the world government to sort of come along and solve the problem, it's not going to happen. It's not how it works. People have to demand and make change. But if enough people do it, then it can happen. And those things provide profound tools that we can use. That seems to be what I'm spending my life doing these days is trying to figure out what those tools are and how to use them most effectively. And today, I'm willing to feel positive about the possibilities because we just won a big fight and that feels good that's a perfect place to end and to say thank you enormously for coming and bearing with me as i've rambled on that's something else that happens as you get older you know um and uh uh, uh it's been a great pleasure and thank you all for being a part of this fight in whatever way you are thank you mm.
All right, the fun is not quite over. We do have Phoenix Books here selling some of Bill's books and he will be out there to sign them. So if you wanna purchase a book and have him sign them, great. If you brought your own book, also great. Thank you all for coming.